Hello and welcome to our webinar, China's Music Industry, Hot Topics in Legal and Business Affairs. My name is Matthew Alderson. I'm a partner at Harris Brick and Attorneys and Consultants in Beijing. I focus my practice on international entertainment transactions involving China or Chinese companies. I started my career many years ago in the music business where I worked in-house for a group of companies in Sydney that included a music management company, a record label, and a music publisher. These days, my music industry clients include international collection societies, major independent music publishers, and recording artists. Joining me today from Los Angeles is Alex Haggard, Head of International at Outdustry Group. This is a position that Alex has held since 2018. Alex was previously the general manager of Outdustry's China operations. He's fluent in Mandarin. Outdustry provides market leading ANR marketing and rights management services in the China and India music markets. And they do that for some of the leading names in the global and local industries. Outdustry have staff located in Beijing, Kuala Lumpur, London, Los Angeles, Mumbai, Shanghai, and Taipei. In today's webinar, we're going to address a number of topics, including recent history of the music business in China, challenges faced by international businesses seeking to engage with China, the platform or DSP landscape. No discussion of China music, of course, would be complete without looking at copyright and rights generally. So we will be taking a look at recent changes to the copyright law in China as they affect music. We'll be talking about royalties, We'll provide some tips for entering deals or doing business in China. And finally, at the end, we'll be trying to answer some of your questions. We've already received a number of really great questions from listeners prior to the webinar, and we'll also be expecting questions to arise while we're speaking. And as I say, we'll try to deal with them toward the end. So to kick things off, Alex, how about giving us your thoughts on the recent history of the music business in China and looking at questions like piracy, the so-called exclusive wars, and the emergence of a paid model in music consumption? Great. Yeah, we'd be happy to. Um, first of all, just want to say thanks very much uh, for the invitation to you, uh, Matthew, and to Harris Bricken. Uh, really happy to be here. Um, so just to give a bit of uh, context on the market, I mean, some people are probably quite familiar now with the market um, since it's, it's seen so much growth over the last few years and, and makes a lot of headlines. Um, but I think a bit of context um, in terms of sort of how we got here can be very helpful, if only to show how far things have come um, in the, I guess, over the last decade or so. Um, so up until the early 2010s, which was around the time that I uh, first arrived in China, um, the the industry was, it was basically a total piracy market. Um, there was, uh, the internet had come along, but there was not very strong um, copyright protection uh, particularly in that area, so you have things like the Baidu MP3 search engine, where you I remember I remember these services being around when I first arrived. You could just you know you go on, you type in the name of a song, it pops up, you download an MP3. Um, not partic not a particularly uh, uh, healthy environment. So, um, and then around around that time, um, there were the the earliest incarnations of what we now know as the uh, the the streaming platforms. Um, you know that. Platforms like Xiaomi, owned by Alibaba, and um, QQ Music, owned by Tencent, um, and these were effectively, you know, um, rough and ready platforms where they were essentially there was no real infrastructure, no licensing, no ingestion of content, um, 
it was largely sort of ripped from the web and plugged into the back of the service. Uh, and that was that. Um, but they started to amass quite sort of significant audiences. So this created a situation where you basically had a, uh, an increasingly active market, but no real um, commercial model. Um, so a few years later, around 2013, um, Tencent's QQ Music at the time and uh, China Music Corporation, which was uh, a big competitor, um, which was the owner of the, the um, platforms Kugo and Kuwa, which still exist today. Um, the, uh, Tencent and China Music Corporation, CMC, were in pretty sort of hot competition. Um, they began trying to monetize the industry um, by basically competing for exclusive licenses uh, from major uh, domestic and um, international catalogs. So that was the the, the global major labels and also um, all the sort of local Chinese labels. Um, and people were sort of going around snapping up catalogs with with um, with big advances. Um, Later on, uh, Netty's Cloud Music, which some people have probably also heard of, but was very new at the time, um, and Alibaba's Xiaomi also got in on this, sort of buying up exclusivity. Um, and so this basically was a way of forcing their, their competitors to license from them. Um, and while this can't be, it, it may seem not particularly healthy, but it can definitely be argued that it kickstarted the industry and um, put the, the Chinese market on, at least on, on people's radars. Um, but a few pretty inherent problems. It created an arms race where content costs just went skyrocketing for these platforms. Um, obviously, they're sort of very well monetized tech uh, uh, ecosystems. So this, you know, they, they weren't lacking money. Um, but platforms would also buy out uh, rights for a number of years. Um, and then they weren't particularly motivated either to sub-license them to their competitors at, at, at sort of um, uh, friendly rates or to provide rights holders with very detailed um, reporting on usage. So there was a lot of energy coming into the market and some money starting to flow through, but, but um, a lot of the sort of the basic infrastructure was, was missing. Um, and sort of to move forward towards the, the paid model. So everyone was, was so desperate for market share at the time that no platform wanted to kind of throttle the user experience because um, they, they were aware that if they started putting things behind a paywall, all the users would just go over to the other, um, the other platforms. Um, so eventually, sub-licensing between platforms began happening. And that was made conditional on everyone falling in line with a, a subscription model, paid subscription model, whereby certain functions were put behind a paywall. Um, and that paywall now still remains relatively stable. Um, it's, uh, so if you were a, um, a subscribe, you can only uh, uh, download music to your phone or cache music to your phone uh, or to your device if you're a subscriber. And you can also only um, play music in high quality if you're a subscriber. Um, and so this was anywhere between sort of uh, for different models, uh, eight and 15 renminbi a month, which is from around $1.25 to $2.30. So we're not, you know, it's not very much money, um, and there's all kinds of sort of bundling options and things as well. Um, and so that that became sort of the relatively stable paywall over the next few years. Um, and now we're just seeing the beginnings of that paywall starting to evolve in a in a really interesting way. Uh, maybe we can get into that uh, a little later. Um, and uh, that's that's had some some really great effects. Um, they uh, the, the international major labels are now beginning to end their exclusives and go direct with with all partners in the market, um, which is something that we've we've always done with um, with all of our clients. And uh, some local labels are beginning to to do the same thing. Um, so it's uh, uh, yeah, things are beginning to to look um, like they're heading in a good direction. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, when I first came to China. The uh, perception of the market was that uh, Chinese consumers would never pay for online content, particularly music. And now we've seen uh, a, a complete reversal of that state of affairs, and we're in a situation where uh, Chinese consumers will willingly pay for content. I might now make some comments on uh, what I see as the major challenges for. Uh, international players seeking to engage with China in the music industry. And uh, I think 
to a certain extent, there'll be a bit of um, overlap with or consistency with the comments that you've just made, Alex. To my mind, there, there are three main challenges facing the industry, or I see three issues coming up again and again in practice. The first one is the inadequacy of metadata moving between the international players and the local players. So I constantly hear that the um, international companies are not providing metadata to the DSPs in China in a manner that will allow the DSPs properly to track consumption and um, pay royalties. And to a certain extent, I think there may be technological reasons for this because I understand that the systems that are used in China by the DSPs are not always compatible with those that are used by the foreign players. And the second point, and this is something that echoes what Alex has said, is that we're still seeing the impact of the heady days in which big advances were paid to the major labels under exclusive deals with the DSPs. And although from the outside that looked good because foreign content, foreign music was generating substantial returns, the problem is that the focus was on an MG, on a minimum guarantee, instead of on royalty income that is based on actual transactions. So what happens in these big deals is that the buyouts discourage a transactional accounting model and they result in a lot of breakage that is unallocable surpluses. So when you have these lumpy payments, you get large pots of money which, because the, the transactional model is not there, can't be clearly allocated to any particular rights owner. And I don't think that that has been very healthy. And the third issue that I see is that collections, copyright collections, are very, very messy and very, very murky. And there are a couple of aspects to this. The first is that in China, the traditional distinctions in the music business between mechanicals, public performance, and now streaming are blurred. And just as China leapfrogged over fixed line telepathy into, um, into mobile, they've also really leapfrogged over a whole series of developments that occurred in the West to get to the point where now effectively all the consumption occurs online and on handheld devices. And this means that when you raise questions like to what extent does a stream or a download include a mechanical or a public performance component, the answer is unclear. Whereas in, in other countries, there are customs which apply and say that a certain proportion of that streaming income is uh, attributable to mechanicals or public performance. So those standards are not applicable here. And the other aspect of it is that the foreign labels deal with both the DSPs and the collection societies. And the major collection society here is the MCSC, uh, the Music Copyright Society of China. And one of the ongoing difficulties in the market is that um, the rights owners find themselves in a situation where they're dealing with the MCSC and the DSPs for the same catalogs, yet conflicting or overlapping royalty claims are made by the collection societies and the DSPs. And the extent of the remit of the collection societies vis-a-vis the platforms is not clear. So you get dual claims and certain inefficiency because both the MCSC and the DSPs pay advances to the foreign rights owners. And then um, the question becomes, well, well, how do you recoup these advances and who's entitled to what? So they are the, the main systemic challenges 
that I see. And Alex, at this point, it might be a good opportunity for us to have a little look at at the platforms in more detail. Perhaps you could provide an overview of the platform landscape and give us your take on the macro problems that beset the music industry in China. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, so far, I think we've we've talked a, a lot of doom and gloom, um, but there's actually um, there's it, it's a, actually an incredibly sort of vibrant um, uh, music consumption landscape out there. Um, it's 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 even sort of tough to summarize the, this because there's just so much uh, activity and innovation, um, incredibly diverse landscape of um, uh, m- of music use and music consumption. Um, there's definitely too many uh, platforms to name them all, um, b- uh, but I'll give an, an overview and, and maybe maybe talk about a couple of the drawbacks as well. Um, so the ones that everyone's probably heard of, um, there are uh, there's uh, TME, Tencent Music Entertainment, Netties, Netties Cloud Music, which is owned by Netties, the sort of the web portal and and gaming company. Um, and then uh, until recently, there was uh, Alibaba, who everyone knows, the massive e-commerce giant, which was um, until recently, a, a, a significant player in that um, streaming landscape too. Um, so uh, th- these are kind of the the incumbents, or were t- uh, so Alibaba shuttered uh, Xiaomi a few uh, c- uh, late January um, to focus on providing music for its uh, social commerce apps, which is another category which I'll come on to in a second. Um, but if we start with TME, so TME almost needs no introduction. Anyone who's following music industry news uh, will know about Tencent Music Entertainment. Um, more the, 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 in their most recent filing, um, they they uh, posted more than forty percent growth um, in paying users from Q4 2019 to 2020. So that's obviously uh, incredible growth that that uh, the is, is very impressive and and um, deserving of of uh, of applause. Um, so TME divided into two main uh, landscape, uh, two main categories, I'd say. Um, three streaming platforms that are kind of recognizable, sort of similar to to the the streaming platform, the you know the, the mainstream platforms that we're used to in the West. There is a QQ Music, which is sort of more popular with first and second tier city users, Kugo and Cool War, which are sort of um, similar ish format, but popular with more sort of second, third, um, fourth tier cities. Um, and then, so outside of those main streaming platforms within TME, you then have their social entertainment. Um, category, which encompasses things like uh, TME Live, which is a live streaming platform, and um, crucially, WeSing, which is um, a, a, a very impressive platform, um, a karaoke platform where users can um, uh, access instrumentals of pretty much all of the music that's that's within Tencent's catalog. Um, Record their own versions, uh, sort of th- their own vocal over the top of a of a um, digitally created instrumental, and then post that um, their their own cover to cover version to the to the platform. Um, so that's you know a, a very interesting and innovative platform. Um, so then that's TME. Then you have uh, Netties, which is uh, Netties Cloud Music, which is. Um, uh, not quite at the scale of Tencent, but uh, it is, you know, often referred to as sort of the the darling of many international uh, labels and artists because of how popular it is with first tier city users who are more likely to be into um, uh, international music, and they're all also more likely to be subscribers. So that's uh, where you kind of find the the more high value uh, users in terms of revenue. Um, Netties has has been a, a, a great partner to the music industry because of this. Um, it has very sort of innovative playlisting and um, great branding, and has done sort of artist discovery very well. Um, Netties also has its own uh, short video platform called Mlog um, and a karaoke platform um, called India, which is uh, sort of a WeSing um, competitor. Um, which which has which launched uh, late last year um, and has been very much making inroads into that very um, sort of uh, active market as well. Um, so that's that's sort of the main recognizable streaming platforms. Um, moving on, you then have short video. Uh, China, you could even say, is the home of short video. Um, the two main um, sort of players there. The biggest one uh, being uh, Douyin, which is uh, the the Chinese version of TikTok. Um, so Douyin is owned by ByteDance, which uh, 
uh, acquired music the, the the platform musically and then turned that into TikTok. So um, Douyin is like the original Chinese TikTok, basically, wh- whose functionality was basically ported over to to create TikTok. Um, so there's Douyin and there's also Kuaishou, which is a, a similar um, app. Uh, it's Douyin's biggest competitor, slightly less music focused, but still an absolute behemoth. Um, it actually, Kuaishou just listed in on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange for, uh, at, floated at 5.3 billion. Um, so, uh, that's, uh, pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Um, and that's, these are also sort of very, very, uh, well monetized ecosystems. Um, then, I mean, that's that's a kind of kind of a good segue to talk about social commerce. Uh, this is going to be um, this is going to prove to be, uh, I would say, one of the most kind of impressive innovations to to come out of China, or at least to be popularized by China. Um, you can kind of include Douyin in this uh, in this category now because you can buy things directly through the Douyin interface. Um, but it's essentially. Uh, Apps where um, e-commerce is uh, fully integrated with um, with social media content. So, for example, um, uh, Alibaba has a, a suite of, of social commerce apps where um, I suppose uh, you could say that influencers on the platform are at the same time kind of creating innovative social content, but um, using that to you know partner with with brands and sell their own products and things like that. And, and the uptake of this um, among the user base has been massive. Um, and like I referenced earlier, Alibaba is now seemingly trying to focus its music resources onto providing music for um, for these social commerce apps. Um, so um, yeah, watch that space. I would say. Um, and then sort of beyond that, you have the video on demand platforms. Um, so just this is just kind of a brief mention, because even though they are heavily involved in music in, in some ways, um, they're not they don't tend to be where the focus of the music industry conversation is. Um, so that would include platforms like um, uh, Billy Billy, which is the uh, often referred to as the YouTube of China. Um, it's sort of a uh, UGC slash kind of professional UGC platform, which also hosts live streams um, and is incredibly well monetized. Um, the vast majority of its revenue comes from um, users uh, buying virtual gifts and uh, sort of tipping uh, creators on on the platform, which is uh, another thing that we can maybe get into a little bit later. Um, also, ITE, which is uh, another one of the sort of biggest uh, subscription video on demand platforms owned by Baidu, which is the, the uh, search giant. Um, so Baidu, so, uh, sorry, ITE hosts uh, most of the music uh, TV shows and variety shows that remain the, the absolute number one to promote the number one way to promote music in China. So the sort of the, uh, the domestic music ecosystem, music promotion, um, ecosystem, uh, is, is very much still focused on you, you break a new artist or a new song through a TV show. And that's the way that you do it pretty much the vast majority for the vast majority of, of artists, um, in the, in the mainstream. Um, and then, um, you have Tencent video, which hosts music videos and, and more variety shows kind of in a similar way to, to IT. Um, but IT has had the most success in the past few years with these TV shows. Most recently, one where um, it's sort of a, a, a battle of the bands, for want of a better term. Um, so, so this, all of this uh, sounds sounds very positive, um, and uh, there's you know some serious efforts towards monetization going on there. Um, but while there are, this is kind of new, you know, new platforms, new models popping up everywhere. Um, the there are some drawbacks. The the, the payouts to uh, rights holders are such that in the in the short term, everyone is very much banking heavily on long term growth in paying subscribers, um, which which is happening. Um, and we you know we as a company believe in this fully. Um, it's gradually heading in the right direction for sure. Um, but the truth is that the market is is certainly nowhere near mature yet. Um, I think it's just uh, important to maybe have a bit of a reality check on that sometimes, um, particularly when there's you know there's so much um, news going around about the market. Um, it often gets referred to as if you know the Chinese market is now a mature market and and sort of in line with with the rest of the world, which is not quite the case yet. Um, so as as uh, Matthew referenced earlier, uh, advances paid out to labels, whether it was for sort of exclusivity or or not. Um, used to be a tool to make it worth people's while doing business 
uh, in the market in the short term. So you'd say it was a way of getting people's attention and sort of getting getting China um, on the map, so to speak. Um, now those advances are beginning to dry up a little um, across the board. Meanwhile, the unit economics of streaming have not quite caught up yet. So the sort of a, the drop in advance and the, the sort of the, the rise in, you know, the, the per play payouts and the revenue share has not quite caught up. So it's in a little bit of an awkward growth phase that, that I'm absolutely sure will, you know, um, the, the trends are, are going towards that, that um, catching up very soon. And we'll talk more about sort of those deal structures in, in a second that can help people take it uh, to, to prepare themselves for that. Um, but meanwhile, uh, in, in that situation, everyone is very uh, excited about um, uh, the, the live industry in China, or they were before 2020 happened, um, which sort of makes up for that shortfall in the short term. Um, so, uh, and just a quick point on on uh, on um, reporting there, which has always always been an issue, as as Matthew uh, referenced, the delivery of content and reporting was always uh, a big issue, but it has come along leaps and bounds uh, over the past few years, uh, particularly on the recording side. Publishing reporting, um, which as a lot, of, a lot of people may know, is, is much more complex. Um, it's very much still in the, in the development stage, you know, working out the kinks um, as we go, which is, uh, you know, we went through that um, those years on, on, the, on the recording side. And uh, it's just, it, you know, it's more complex, but it's really the same path of development that's happening. So it's, that's, that's good news. Well, thanks, Alex, and I think there's a lot more to talk about when we return in a minute to discuss royalties. Mm. But for now, what I'd like to do is discuss the topic of rights and look at the sometimes thorny issue of copyright in China. I think it's important to remember that the tremendous developments that we're seeing in the Chinese music industry are driven by an increasingly effective copyright system. And the reason I say that is that China has moved quite rapidly from uh, an almost entirely piracy-driven market to a market that follows copyright fundamentals. And although sometimes we're critical of some of these big advanced-driven deals, the reality is that because of those deals, Large Chinese companies have acquired valuable intellectual property assets, which they are now quite prepared to protect using the Chinese copyright system and Chinese copyright law. And for this reason, the vast majority of cases in Chinese courts involving copyright are between Chinese companies. It's no longer a thing that is used by Foreigners, particularly Americans and Europeans, to um, to badger the Chinese about infringement. It's a thing which has an intrinsic value, which is recognised by the Chinese. Now, the thing with copyright in China is that, at least in so far as it applies to music, musical works and sound recordings receive very different treatment. Musical works enjoy copyright protection, but sound recordings only enjoy neighbouring rights. And for those of you not familiar with that, neighbouring rights are those that apply to certain types of sub subject matter which are not thought to be sufficiently substantive to attract pure copyright protection. And the reason uh, for this distinction is that in China, sound recordings are considered to be insufficiently original to qualify as copyright works. And in Chinese juris jurisprudence, they set the standard of originality very, very high. And sports broadcasts and music videos have suffered a similar fate to sound recordings. And I call this in some of my writings about this question the stranglehold of originality. And I'll give you a, an example using music video because I mentioned that um, the issues come up in cases brought by music labels against karaoke bars in connection with music video copyright in China. And um, the issue is that a public performance license is required by the karaoke bar 
only if the music video is a work of cinematography, that is a, a work that satisfies the high threshold of originality. And no license is required for something which is merely a music video or, or a, a video recording, should I say. Um, and the rule of thumb that gets applied in this area is whether the music video is scripted or not. And uh, to use an example given by my friend Jiarui Leo at Stanford, the application of this rule would mean that uh, the music video for Michael Jackson's Thriller would enjoy copyright protection, but the video for Moonwalker Live at Madison Square Garden would not. So I hope that gives you a, a better idea of how that issue is, is playing out in China. In China, musical work copyright includes the network communication right, which is often re- referred to as the streaming right or the online right of dissemination. And it also includes the broadcast right. And it's these rights which allow the musical work copyright owner to control and collect royalties from streaming and from broadcasting. But Chinese copyright law only gives the sound recording copyright owner a right of approval and a right of remuneration when the network communication right is exercised. So those two rights, the right of approval and the right of remuneration, you can see are not rights of copyright. They are neighboring rights. And though these rights allow record labels to obtain payments for the streaming of their sound recordings, they are still merely neighboring rights and not rights of copyright. And the point that has been controversial for many years has been that there has never been a broadcast right of any kind for sound recordings in China. And in many ways, China was quite similar to the United States in that respect. But that's about to change. From 1 June this year, Chinese copyright law will recognize a new neighboring right which is a right of remuneration for certain broadcasts. So again, it's not a copyright, it's a neighbouring right, but it's a right of remuneration for sound recording broadcasts, and that's a new thing and a positive development. The new right will apply when a sound recording is transmitted by wired or wireless means or communicated to the public by audio technology. And subject to whatever the implementing regulations may say, the new right is being interpreted by local industry as applying to radio and TV broadcasts, to non-interactive web broadcasts and simulcasts, and to performance in public places such as supermarkets and hotels. And the reason I mention implementing regulations is that Typically, when China enacts a new law, we see the law which sets the overall contours, and then later the Chinese provide regulations which guide us as to the meaning and and smooth out some of the asperities in in the law. Last time I looked, we hadn't seen the implementing regulations for the changes to the copyright law, and it may be that in those implementing regulations, we get some more guidance about how these issues uh, are going to unfold. And I mentioned music video. There are moves now for to introduce a new audio visual uh, copyright work, which will subsume the right uh, that the work of cinematography and also um, uh, uh, video works, but the underlying problem which I illustrated in relation to music video will still remain because the law doesn't answer that question squarely, where do you draw the line? Now, the thing is that the collection process that will apply to this new income stream remains unclear. And as I said earlier, collections in this country are murky and unclear at the best of times. We don't yet know whether there will be a new collection society for this income or whether one of the uh, existing collection societies will be expected to collect. Again, we're going to need to see what the 
implementing regulations say about this. But if the process works, the introduction of the new right should open up a flow of broadcast royalties for record labels. And the thing is that the Chinese broadcasters uh, can hardly be expected to welcome uh, that idea. So there's going to be a tension between those stakeholders as the new law is implemented and interpreted. And what we hope is that the flow of royalties will not just be a trickle. And industry, I think, uh, expects initially the assessment is that, that the that the new income will make up about the same proportion of overall income as as public performance revenue does, which was on 2019 figures about 12% of um, the overall um, receipts. Alex, I'm not sure if you've got anything to add on that. I know it's a big topic and it's very hard to do it justice, but I wanted to focus on the changes as they affect music without going into the other stuff. But unless you've got any other thoughts, it might be a good point at which to return to royalties and to look at um, how the deals are structured and common deal structures and, and so on. Yeah, for sure. I think those are very um, uh very, it's a very complex issue uh, that you just, uh, I think, explained very well there. So I, I won't, I won't try and add anything onto that. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, a common topic that uh, that we often get asked about is, you know, how do royalties work? Am I going to make any money from China? And if I do, um, how do I get it out of the country? Um, and you know, this is something that we spend a lot of time on: is is making sure that um, the the deals that we're working on are, are set up in a uh, you know, a dynamic and, and sustainable way. Uh, so our, our clients are uh, well set up to benefit from, to share in the, the uh, their partner's growth in the market and, and you know, um, uh, uh, to, to establish a kind of a healthy ecosystem. Um, so maybe I could talk a little bit about um, uh, the common deal structures and, and, and how things work. Um, so, there's, there's actually, I mean, anyone who's done um, licensing deals or is familiar with licensing deals anywhere else in the world for for this kind of uh, co content, or I guess with with these kinds of platforms, um, they're not. There's not too different or too dissimilar, um, or at least if anyone is is telling you uh, it needs to be totally different because you're in a different because this is China, then that's not actually true, and that's actually a bit of a, a red flag. Um, and uh, I would say that so depending on the on the kind of service that you're doing a deal with, um, you'll have you know that your commercials will be a combination of uh, you know per stream rates, uh, revenue shares, uh, per subscriber rates have been popular in the past couple of years. Um, so that last one being particularly um, quite uh, an interesting one to explore. Um, so that's per subscriber rates. So so. Um, the rights holders getting getting paid based on how many subscribers the platforms have, because there's a lot of discounting that goes on. Um, there are there are, as I mentioned earlier, all kinds of um, bundles uh, that, that each of these platforms is um, is sort of you know, and it's a very creative thing that they're doing, getting getting creative by by bundling things together. That's you know no no problem with that, but it's just something to, you know, when there's so much discounting going on, um, and the the key kind of um, uh, the 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 key goal for a lot of the platforms is user uh, subscriber acquisition. Um, it's something that um, rights holders need to be aware of and, and build into their deals. Um, so I would say uh, always explore all of these options. Um, there's nothing that's kind of unheard of. Um, I would say, uh, all, you know, if, if you're in a position to always do aim for an advance uh, because, um, you know, the, the the market does require uh, a lot of kind of day-to-day -day attention it's not something that you can just sort of do the deal and then wait for the money to roll in it's it's not not exactly how it how it works um yet so um an advance can kind of you know um essentially cover the the overheads of of uh, spending uh, so much time going back and forth with with uh, with your partners um to sort of figure out how they work and, and you know get all of the all of your reporting and invoicing and everything um so those those so always aim for an advance then as i mentioned earlier they're not what they used to be um 
it's uh, you know as the as the platforms become a lot more kind of mature and and also we we have um, publicly traded companies um, among our partners now who are obviously they've they, they have to um, their their belts belts get tightened in those in those circumstances so um, uh, we so yeah that's that's uh, a couple of tips there is you know always try and try and push for an advance where possible and um, it really helps if you're able to come with some kind of data to to back up the arguments that you're that you're making in negotiations um, that's and that's something that we didn't have until a couple of years ago um you know there's now some pretty solid verifiable data that that we can go into negotiations with um which is uh, which is good good for everyone i'd say um the deals end up being fairer to both sides um so an, another question is are, are the current um payouts uh and and rates in the market sustainable um and i think uh, I mean, the, the the short answer is no, but uh, they are. Uh, I mean, ideally, we would get to a point where the services are, you know, all all generating plenty of revenue. Uh, the revenue share model is always the revenue share kind of uh, calculation in the in the deals is always kicking in whenever um, you know whenever the sort of reporting period comes around. Um, services are growing. Business is booming, and uh, and rights holders are sharing in that growth. That would be the the ideal situation. Um, but the the problem with that is is not. I mean, obviously, numbers of subscribers are growing very quickly, um, which which is a really good thing. You know, as I mentioned, Tencent has seen um, forty percent uh, uh, year on year growth to to Q four twenty twenty. That's really healthy growth. But uh, the current market standard. Uh, revenue shares per play rates um, and such are really off the bottom of the scale when compared to uh, players of um, comparative sizes in uh, more developed markets um, in in the rest of the world. And like I referenced earlier, um, the the uh, the platforms in China are often mentioned in in the same breath as as these you know the, the um, as, as companies like Spotify, Apple. Um, and uh, and and um, uh, remember that uh, uh, TME and, and Spotify are actually kind of valued at around the same at the moment, um, just despite one being a lot better uh, sort of um, monetized than the other. Um, which which is why I say that everyone's banking on this this long term growth, which does seem to be coming, but it's uh, it's definitely a long term market, not uh, not a short term um, a short term kind of cash grab, um, because the the you know, if you're expecting to to come in and then find those and, and just sort of instantly start making money with no effort from those from those rates, that's not going to happen because those market standard rates are very different to what they are in the rest of the world. Um, but gradually catching up. Um, one big question um, that we that we often uh, you know we, we that we deal with every day is um, how once you've Okay, you've you've um, you've got some music licensed. You're doing well. You know you, you, your artists are popular. You're making some money. You're seeing money coming through on the reports, getting money out of the country. Um, and and um, uh, this is uh, one of the the most complex issues I would say on, on in terms of sort of um, uh, doing business in in China. And I'm sure Matthew can can attest to that as well, um, because tax sort of uh, tax is a is a really big. Um, a very difficult topic. Uh, so, and just to to get into the weeds um, on it for a second, um, the streaming platforms are very much set up to, or have been setting themselves up to uh, report tax inclusive um, pre tax numbers, pre tax revenue to uh, to rights holders, which can be very problematic for rights holders because they have they end up with um, you know revenue appearing on their books that. Uh, tax was then subsequent from which tax was then subsequently deducted, which um, in in the music industry can be very problematic. Um, you know, if, if someone's to be audited or or um, uh, or, or um, anything like that. Um, and tax is also unpredictable. It kind of depends on what uh, which can, it can depend on what part of China you're in, which bank you're with, um, and, and also just kind of changes on a on a semi regular uh, semi regular and but but also unpredictable uh, basis. So um, the, the 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 golden rule, if you can keep to it, is is agree everything net of tax. Um, make sure you know when you're signing that contract 
what these figures are actually going to mean. Um, because sometimes we've, we've seen people bundle into deals saying, "Hey, okay, uh, this is the this is you know the, the uh, there will be China side taxes deducted from whatever this number is," and then people get really badly burned when they find out that there's some huge tax that they weren't expecting. So, if even if you're not able for some reason to uh, to agree net of tax numbers, at least get very clear on what the post tax numbers are likely to be, um, just so your expectations are, are clear. Um, one final point on that. On getting money out of the country, um, it's it's uh, unfortunate, but but totally normal to uh, have a, uh, a sort of thirty to forty five day period from your partner receiving the uh, any invoice that you might issue them to you actually receiving the the payment. And most um, local partners will will um, try and make sure that that's written into the deal. And it's actually advisable to have that in there. And if you can, um, uh, penalties for Going over that that threshold, um, so and just just very quickly, um, other uh, potential uh, trip wires that you would always want to make sure you you address in the content. Um, so reporting schedules, uh, make sure that um, if you're doing a deal that the uh, that you know exactly how often you're going to be receiving reports, push for as often as possible, um, and uh, make sure that they're being provided to you. Um, uh, on uh, sort of automatically, there's no kind of manual intervention going on there. Um, and, uh, you know, how regular, so if you receive, let's say a, a monthly report, it does, is it a monthly report with a weekly breakdown? Um, I realize this is quite sort of, uh, getting into some pretty, pretty, um, granular detail here, but these things are, are very important. Um, and then just finally, uh, an important to topic to, to touch on is, um, what happens with UGC? Because a lot of these platforms are still, you know, even platforms that are owned by the big guns are still allowing UGC in some form. Um, so, for example, sometimes, and this is something that people, a lot of people who've been doing business in the market for a long time either aren't aware of or are sort of maybe some, sometimes turning a blind eye to. Um, on, let's say, you're a record label uh, and or, or uh, you know, an artist management company or, or an artist yourself, um, you might find UGC versions of your music videos. So, just user uploaded music videos. On the major platforms appearing on your artist page so um if anyone uh, uh who's, who's watching today um is at a record label uh, or is an artist himself and does have access to the platforms it might be worth just checking hey are, are user uploaded versions of my music videos appearing on my on my page rather than the um the, the official versions um so and particularly on on platforms like um we sing, for example, which uh, is is a sort of, you know, they thrive on music uh, on on, uh, on UGC because it's users generating um, cover versions of songs, which is really great. You know, it's it's a such an interesting way of of users engaging with music. But anything that does open up that UGC capability does kind of create that issue. So um, it's that's something to to address um, or to I don't know. Um, maybe even use as a as a uh, a lever in in negotiations. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's the, the, I mean, there's could go on about that for hours. There are so many potential tripwires, but those are some those are some key ones. Thanks for that, Alex. I certainly agree with what you said, and uh, particularly your point on on advances and um, on data. Um, I think one of the points that comes out of what we were saying earlier about the systemic difficulties is the fact that, uh, like I said, the collection societies and the DSPs will at times make overlapping uh, claims and uh, you can be faced with a question from the DSP like, well, um, why would we why would we pay for this again? when um, an advance has already been paid to the collection society and that puts down with pressure on the advance and also the question of data is a very, very good one. You've really got to know your market and if you have a catalogue of music, it's going to help you negotiate a deal if you've made some effort to find out how it's being um, absorbed by China or how it's being consumed in China where the listeners are, who they are, what the demographics are, what the popularity is, rather than just drawing inferences from your experience in the West, which in many cases won't apply. I've got some 
other uh, basic tips to add to the list. And these are tips for contracts and deals generally. The, the first one that comes up all the time is you've got to remember that mostly in contracts, a choice of Chinese law and jurisdiction is going to be the best one for you. And the reason for that is that Chinese courts will generally not enforce foreign judgments. So if you select or if your lawyers select the law of California or the law of England and Wales and the jurisdiction of the courts in those places, thinking that that makes you safe, it can put you in a position where you're in the worst of both worlds because you will find your Chinese partners effectively out of reach if you need to initiate a dispute or to um, even find the leverage for a dispute. But at the same time, they can come and avail themselves of your courts uh, quite easily. And that leads me to the next question, which is choice of language. And although Chinese law does not require that contracts be in Chinese, the best practice is that they ought to be in Chinese or at least bilingual. There are two reasons for that. The first is that if there is ever a dispute, your ultimate forum will be in China if you're able to get there because you've made the right choice of law and jurisdiction. And the proceedings, surprise, surprise, will be conducted in Chinese. And the first thing that the decision maker will do is to um, ask for a Chinese language translation of a contract that's in English or some other language. And if you are at that point in the grips of a dispute, it's most unlikely that you'll be able to agree on it. And the uh, court appointed translation will probably be of a low quality, meaning that um, you, you create all sorts of other problems. And the second thing is that although the people that you're dealing with will generally be good speakers of English, the people whose job it is to calculate and pay the royalties and to deal with the mechanics of your agreement at the back end of the business will not be English speakers and they will not understand the niceties of your agreement with all of the little clauses here and there about royalty computation and so on. So we recommend Chinese language for those two reasons. And the final point, the final tip is that uh, you've got to resist the temptation to enter short form agreements. The Chinese like short form agreements. They prefer generalities to specifics in contract making. Not always, but often. And uh, what you really need to do is resist the temptation to sign a, a letter of intent or some other short form agreement, which you think looks innocuous, but which will really put you in a position from which it's impossible to get out. So, yeah, all, all, all great, all great points. Those are all, those are all so, so key to remember. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's sort of an overlap and a consistency in our experiences in that respect. So that concludes the substantive part of the webinar. And now what I'd like to do is turn to the questions. We've got a number of very searching and varied questions that have come through already and um, some others have popped up along the way. So I'm just going to grab a few to see if I can answer them. Um, the first one, any limitation to foreign investment in China's music business? Well, the answer to that is Yes, there is. And like the film and TV businesses, the music business in China is a restricted sector. So foreigners can't independently engage in production and um, distribution and other sorts of activities. And um, that is why um, you need to have a partner or to have a licensee in China. Alex, why don't you grab a question and um, and have a go at answering. Yeah, sure, sure. Just look at it. I guess we're we're not too far off time, so I'll do it sort of a bit a bit rapid fire. But there's, we have a great question about uh, censorship. Uh, so, how does the PRC, People's Republic of China government, execute censorship of music content? Um, this is a really interesting one because a lot of people assume that this is something that we that that you know doing business in music business in China you'll encounter all the time. But the interesting thing here is that 
when uh, at least in the digital world, um, the burden of uh, clearing censorship is not on the rights holder; it's on the streaming platform. So, uh, in terms of day-to-day um, kind of engagement with censorship, uh, almost nothing, pr- pretty much nothing, unless you know sometimes the platforms ha- will um, respond that a certain thing doesn't, a certain content doesn't meet censorship um, standards. Um, the only time we've, you know, our heaviest engagement with uh, censorship has been when we're putting out CDs uh, and or vinyl, um, which isn't a huge part of the business um, these days. So it's it's there, but it's not huge. So um, yeah, n- not not a, a massive part of the sort of the day to day operation. And here's another interesting one: How do you see Tencent and NetEase's strong positions in the market evolving in the future, and what are the main threats? I think Alex dealt with that in his comments earlier, but what I'd like to add to that is that one of the developments we're seeing now, um, it's only arisen in recent months, is an increased willingness on the part of Chinese regulars, regulators to take on the platforms and the internet companies uh, about questions relating to market share and unfair competition. And that has had um, a very serious effect on ten cents share value uh, in in recent times, um, and this is a, a trend. And to answer the question of threat, that I think is is going to increase. Another question here: What about the IP protection for foreign songs used in China? The situation is is the same as, as it is for for local songs. Um, Copyright can be registered. The difficulty, of course, is that the way the system works here is that it's very hard to register copyright for an entire catalogue. So copyright um, registration or formal recognition of copyright on a song-by-song basis is impracticable. But the Chinese notice and takedown systems used by the platforms and the e-commerce companies are very effective and work quite well as long as you have all of the information organized so that you can establish that you are the copyright owner. Mm. Alex? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, I think that's a really good point. And, and also kind of links into a question that's come in um, during the webinar. How do you deal with infringing UGC content on platforms? Do you take down, ignore, try to monetize? Um, that's, that's really interesting. Um, the China does have a uh, safe harbor law. And so, for example, on uh, WeSing or, or, or sort of comparable platforms, if you want to have content taken down, you absolutely can. And uh, these days, I would say that's probably more so than before. That's our, our, our go-to is to, you know, have it, it's it, to have content taken down before you start kind of negotiating about it. Um, it's because you know China is a is a more developed market now than it than it was previously, and so um, there's you know starting off a, a negotiation on on that foot, um, saying right, let's make sure the content isn't available, and then we'll negotiate how it's going to how how it's going to become available. Um, <clears throat> however, I mean that's that's down to however you want to play that. Um, if you know it, if your content is really popular. Um, if it's you know being been uploaded everywhere and it's really popular, that can be a really strong bit of leverage in a negotiation. Um, and you know we've we've definitely been in cases before where we're we're saying, look, the, you know some of these songs that that we're um, that we're speaking on behalf of are uh, they're racking up you know millions you know dozens of millions of of plays um and so it's it's obviously popular um and let's do a deal so um i guess probably kind of similar to to how you might treat it um anywhere else but uh but there are systems for you know there there is notice and takedown and and safe har- uh, safe harbor that um uh that compels uh platforms to take down content when requested Thanks. And quickly, I'll try and answer this last question. What difficulties do professional concert pianists face when planning performances in China? Normally, I wouldn't touch that with a barge pole, but recently I had the good fortune of being at a party at which um, a concert pianist, a Chinese concert pianist, performed a recital. I got talking to him afterwards and he said the biggest problem is that uh, it's difficult to tune the pianos and get the venue to take the tuning and, and the setup requirements of a concert pianist seriously. 
and this causes no end of difficulties. I'm also told, by the way, that all the innovation in classical music now is taking place in China, and according to this fellow, um, the uh, European and um, American uh, classical music scenes, if I can use that word, have become moribund. I think that completes the webinar now, and I want to thank you all for listening. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all of your questions, but I do hope that you've enjoyed it. We're happy to take questions by email if you'd like to contact us after the webinar. Thanks, Alex. Great. Thanks very much, everyone, and, and thanks, Matthew, and to Harris Bricken.